Let's just pray. Father, we are um, in awe that of your love for us and of the way that you work in our lives. Um, there's such diversity here among us, and yet you are working with your power and your love in all of our lives. And so thank you for these stories this morning and the reminder of um, you changing lives. Thank you. Now, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come, that you would fill our hearts, enable us to hear what you have for us this morning. Do what only you can do and use the words that are before us to land in our hearts and souls and change lives. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. So in a couple of minutes, we're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So if you want to have your Bibles or your apps open to that, you can turn there now. We're in a sermon series titled Church 101, where we're using Paul's letter to the Corinthian church to explore what it looks like for a community of people to try to live out Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the Mount. And it turns out, based on the church at Corinth, that it can be pretty messy. I mean, this was a church where people were getting drunk at communion, there were power struggles, there was sexual promiscuity, and yet, even in the chaos, God was at work. Now, one of the challenges that the early church faced was around leadership. And Paul addresses this in his letter to them. So to set us up to hear what he has to say, let's first touch on the concept of signaling. And we're going to use a couple of animals to help us do this. So first of all, there's the springbok. This is a gazelle in southern Africa. And when it realizes that it's being stalked by a cheetah, it jumps high into the air. It's called pronking. I love that word. And this seems like a problem as far as a survival strategy, because by jumping up, the springbok has basically said, here I am to every predator. But scientists believe that pronking is the springbok's way of signaling its power, because a springbok that can jump high is a springbok that's agile and fast. And so the cheetah can save them both a whole lot of time and energy by finding something slower to snack on. Pronking is what scientists call honest signaling because it accurately dis- signals the power that the springbok has. People do this kind of signaling too. So, for example, around this place or actually anywhere, I have no hope ever of understanding or fixing anything mechanical or electrical. But there are a couple of volunteers on our facility team, Mike Graham and Ron Winter, who do. And so when one of them says, I can fix that, it's a true signal. And it's helpful for the rest of us to know this, because now we know that whatever the issue is, is being handled by someone with the power to do it. It saves us all a whole lot of time and energy. And in his book, Corruptible, social scientist Brian Kloss points out that there is such a thing as dishonest signaling as well. So in the animal kingdom, the classic example of this is the fiddler crab. So fiddler crabs have a huge claw that they use to warn away rivals. And when fiddler crabs fight, the defeated male often gets its oversized claw torn off, which is really gross. And this claw grows back after a while, But even though that new claw looks large and intimidating, it's actually useless. The male with the regrown claw would lose any fight at all, but because its claw appears impressive, he can intimidate other crabs. The fake claw is a dishonest signal. It's a false impression of power that just isn't there. It's a bluff. Humans engage in dishonest signaling, too. And you can see how this is a problem. If I were to point, if, sorry, if you were to point out an electrical problem, I wouldn't. And I were to say to you, I can fix that, well, that would be a dishonest signal. Either I don't understand my true ability, which is dangerous, or I'm trying to deceive you and impress you, which is even more dangerous. Dishonest signaling is bad for relationships, and when it creeps into leadership, it's bad for whole systems of relationships. When someone who is in a position of trust or influence over others, or someone who wants that position of trust and influence, gives a false impression of their trustworthiness, the outcome is ugly. When a leader appears larger than life, people get hurt. Dishonest signaling happens everywhere, and yes, 
It happens in the church. We've seen that play out in some of the recent heartbreaking public leadership failures where power has been misused by people we trusted. In her book about power in the church, psychologist Diane Langberg writes that any study of power misused is also always a study of deception, first of the self and then of others. Deception, dishonest signaling. So today we're talking about power and leadership in the church using Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. And this was a church that was feeling the effects of some dishonest signaling. Some would-be leaders in the church were using the reputations of leaders like Paul and Apollos and Peter to say that they were with one of those leaders, trying to gain credibility for themselves. And the church was fracturing around this. And so in chapter 4, Paul talks about what really matters in leadership. What are the honest signals of Christian leadership? By the way, Having a Jesus-centered understanding of leadership is important for all of us, not just for a few folks with titles that signify leadership, because there will be an area where you are influencing someone. Maybe you're a parent or a grandparent. You're a volunteer in Kids Zone. You're organizing service projects. You're facilitating a small group. You get the picture. The leadership lessons here do apply to you. But even apart from that, we all need to know the markers of leaders who are worthy of a place of influence in our lives and in our church so that we can support and encourage and pray for them. Because when we look for and applaud the wrong signals of leadership power, signals that operate a lot like the fiddler crab's useless claw, then we can unwittingly contribute to an unhealthy relationship system that hurts people. So turning now to 1 Corinthians 4, Paul is going to give us three images of leaders that will challenge our cultural ideas of leadership. The leader as a servant, not a master. The leader as a humiliated captive at the back of the line, not the celebrated leader at the front. And the leader as a father, not a babysitter. So each of these images highlights a different characteristic, a different signal of a leader who is living in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to go through chapter 4 in three sections to highlight these three images, and then we'll land where Paul does, power in leadership. So starting with 4, verses 1 through 7, we're going to have the image of the leader as a servant or as a household manager. This, then, is how you ought to regard us, as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? When we think of a leader, we tend to think of someone who's in charge, top of the org chart, a master. And so we associate certain characteristics with leaders, like powerful, commanding, charismatic, competent. Paul wrote these words 2,000 years ago to a church that was borrowing from the wisdom of its surrounding culture to define leaders. The city of Corinth placed a premium on wealth, on status, and on winning. And so a leader in this city would be smart, influential, powerful, and sophisticated. Sounds a little bit familiar, doesn't it? But in the upside-down kingdom of Jesus, leadership also gets turned upside down. After all, Jesus is our king who said, I am among you as one who serves. So in verse 1 here, Paul is echoing Jesus. And his first picture of leadership is not of a master in charge, but of a servant or steward who manages the master's estate. And he tells the Corinthians to think of him and Apollos, 
whom they knew to be genuine leaders in the church as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries of God. In this image, it's the master who has the power, not the servant. The master sets the agenda. He provides the resources. And good servants get to know their master. They learn what he wants so they can anticipate his wishes. And then they use their creativity and their hard work to enact his agenda with the resources and authority that he has given them. And using this image, Paul points out the first characteristic, that first honest signal of leaders. They're faithful. In Romans, Paul uses a similar word, diligent, to describe good leadership. And so this is one of those places where the wisdom of God sounds like foolishness to the world. In a culture that celebrates charisma and genius and skill, words like diligent and faithful are kind of resume killers. They're not descriptors of someone who's on a leadership fast track in our world. But it turns out that they are good descriptors of leaders, of disciples in the kingdom. And the implication then is that it's the master's approval that matters. Not the opinion of the other servants or even of the guests of the master. It's his well done that really matters. And that's why Paul says in verse 3 that he cares very little if others judge him. Jesus' opinion is the one that matters. When leaders in the church, or actually anyone, start to base their value on the others' opinions of their skills and accomplishments, authenticity is often the very first casualty. Because someone, depending on others' good opinions, will start to shape what they do and say just so they can keep people happy. And maybe they'll begin to cover up failures and hide sin because they can't risk having people think badly of them. Hidden, unrepented sin will begin to hollow out their souls and there will be a growing mismatch between who they are inside and who they appear to be. Like fiddler crabs, they'll appear more impressive than they are. So in the kingdom, leaders are servants of the master, not masters themselves. And the signal of a good leader is that they're faithful. Eyes fixed on their master, they manage his treasures in a way that aligns with his will. Now in verses 8 to 13, this is our second chunk, Paul's going to give us another image. And this one is based on a Roman emperor's victory march, where the leader, the Caesar, would parade through the streets so that everyone could witness his power and greatness. And at the very end of the parade would be his prisoners of war on their way to death in the arena. Captives on display for the crowds to mock. So, verse 8. Paul is going to be quite sarcastic here. I actually find it quite funny. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have begun to reign, and that without us. How I wish you really had begun to reign so that we might also reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored. We are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. The Corinthians were congratulating themselves on their sophistication, their prestige, their intelligence. And they were using their so-called alignment with different leaders like Paul and Apollos to establish themselves as greater than one another, to say who was in and who was out. They were acting like the Roman Caesars, celebrating their own wisdom and status, comfortably watching and evaluating the action in the arena, giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down on the performances there. But where are those leaders? the apostles that the Corinthians profess to be following, they're not at the front of the line where you expect the victorious leader. They're at the back of the line. They're the captives on display, humiliated, mocked on their way to the arena, like Jesus. Mocked by the Roman soldiers and religious leaders, 
as he was tortured to death on the cross. The crucifixion was a spectacle that looked like defeat in the world. And yet in love, he submitted to this. He refused to use power as the world said he should, and he blessed his enemies even as they were killing him. And he calls us to do the same, to take up our cross and to follow him. Pastor Glenn Packham, writing about leadership in the church, puts it this way. A disciple is not one who simply believes in the cross or is grateful for Jesus' cross. A disciple is one who follows Jesus so closely that they take up their cross. Their life has taken on the same shape as Jesus. To be a disciple is to be cruciform. Paul is reminding us that within the community of people defined by Jesus, leadership is cruciform. It's cross-shaped. Theologian N.T. Wright says that we can expect Christian ministry to be more like the experience of the humiliated captives in the ring, uncomfortable and really unglamorous. Cruciform, or cross-shaped leadership, isn't about platform, celebrity, honor. It's about humility. Cruciform leadership doesn't use its power to dominate others, to demand respect, or even insist on its rights. Leaders are first and foremost disciples of Jesus, learning from him to respond to slander with kindness, to return curses with blessing, to endure persecution. Cruciform, cross-shaped, is that second honest signal of a leader. And none of this makes sense against the world's standards of bigger, faster, better, and smarter. It's foolishness in a status-hungry, competitive culture. But this is God's timeless wisdom at work, overpowering evil with self-sacrificing love. So to recap, in the kingdom, leaders are servants. They're not masters, and they're faithful. Leaders are more likely to be like the captives at the back of the line rather than the Caesar at the front of the parade. Leadership is cruciform or cross-shaped. And finally... Leaders will behave more like fathers than like guardians. So starting with verse 14 of chapter 4. I am writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Some of you have become arrogant as if I were not coming to you, but I will come to you very soon if the Lord is willing, and then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline, or shall I come in love and with a gentle spirit? Paul reminds the Corinthians here of the force of their relationship, describing himself as a father to them. He contrasts this with guardians, or as some translations put it, babysitters. And so the term referred to an in-house servant or slave who had the job of looking after the kids. And their goal, like babysitters everywhere, was just to keep the kids alive and out of trouble until the parents came home. But a good parent, a good father, loves his children. He has long-term hopes for them. He wants to see them flourish. He wants to be near them. And Paul can't be with the Corinthians right now, so he does the next best thing. He sends them Timothy, who he calls his son, by extension their brother, so that they can be reminded of his presence and love. He's not using words of shame to control them. He's sending a person to encourage them. He wants Timothy to remind them about how he lives so that, like kids everywhere, they can imitate him and share in all that he has. This kind of love is crucial for healthy leadership because the power that leaders are granted is only safely expressed in relationships of love. Henry Nouwen writes this, What makes the temptation of power so seemingly irresistible? Maybe it is that power offers an easy substitute for the hard task of love. It seems easier to be God than to love God, easier to control people 
than to love people, easier to own life than to love life. So our final image of leadership, a parent, not a babysitter, reminds us that a leader is one who loves others, like Jesus did, like we're all called to do. So these then are Paul's three images of leadership, a servant, not a master, a captive, not a ruler, a father, not a babysitter. And each points to an honest signal of Christian leaders, faithful, cruciform, loving. And now Paul references the true power that is behind good leadership, the power that runs life in the kingdom of God. And he challenges the people who are boasting about different leaders. He suspects dishonest signaling, some fiddler crabs who are looking more impressive than they are. And he wants to check out how well these would-be leaders' speech lines up with their power. And then he delivers this line in verse 20, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What is this power for life and leadership in the kingdom of God? It's the Holy Spirit, whom theologian Gordon Fee describes as God's empowering presence. A couple of weeks ago, Andrew spoke about the, Paul's description of the Spirit's work in our lives. And we learned that the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is actually within us, forming the character of Christ in us. Yes, sometimes the Spirit will exercise his power in ways that seem spectacular to us. Maybe someone will be speaking a special language, or someone will be healed, or someone will suddenly understand what's going on in the spiritual realm. Sometimes he does this. But what the Spirit always does is form the character of Jesus in us as we partner with him. That means that when we are living in the power of the Holy Spirit, then we will increasingly look like Jesus. Just like the Springboks jump, our transforming character is the honest signal of the Holy Spirit's power and presence in our lives. Here's Glenn Packiam again. The only authority or power that we have is that which comes from the anointing of the Spirit of the Lord, and that same Spirit works to form Christ in us. The source of authority determines its shape. Our authority comes from Jesus, and it is to be used as Jesus used his power, to empty ourselves in service and self-giving love. Paul reminds his Corinthians who have been placing so much value on the performance and the verbal skills of some of the leaders. The kingdom of God operates on a world-changing power, the power of the Spirit that is visible in how people live, not in their words, not in their popularity or their education or their accomplishments, not even in the miracles they might be a part of. The signals of leadership power in God's kingdom are faithfulness, cruciformity, and love. So as we conclude, I'd like to suggest two applications for us today. The temptation might be to critique a leader you or I know in light of this framework, but that can easily lead us into the trap of judgmentalism that Jesus warns us against and that Paul warned us against in verse 5 of this passage. So I wonder if instead we could do two things. First, ask the Holy Spirit to help you evaluate who's influencing you. Is it possible that you are giving someone outsized influence in your life just based on their gifts or ability or platform or popularity? And ask Jesus to help you right-size that influence. Even more helpful, though, I think, is to ask if there is someone who should have a larger voice in your life based on the character of Christ that you see growing in them. Chances are you'll need to look for them at the back of the line. And second, ask the Holy Spirit to shine a light on a relationship where you are influencing someone, where you are a leader. Where might he be inviting you to greater faithfulness as his servant, calling you to live a cruciform life like Jesus did, wanting to infuse you with more of his love? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your words to us and pray this morning, that um, whatever words are of you, that those would land, that those would take root and flourish, and that you would blow away anything that was not of you. Please, Father, show us how we can grow in faithfulness as your servants. 
Give us the ability, the power to live a cruciform life as you did. And above all, enable us to receive your love so that we can share it with the world. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to stand, I'll bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace.